We minister in Dundee, and we are in the Church of Scotland with um, a congregation called Downfield Mains. Um, just to give you a bit of background on Dundee, just before I start, just so that you understand what your partnership is with, um, we are a church on the north side of the city of Dundee. Um, we are a congregation of about 125 to 150, and we gather together weekly, and we are, as you see from those who are with us, um, seeking after God. We're, we're praying for revival in our nation. And um, we minister in probably one of the most poor areas of the city. Uh, we call it a, an area of multiple deprivation and poverty. And yet God is doing a work. And so it's a joy uh, for us to be there. And it's not without difficulty, let me tell you. Um, there's a huge difference between highlands and downfield mains and, and downfield Kirkton, Scotland. But let me tell you something, there's no difference in the power of the Holy Spirit or Christ and the Word of God, amen? We are, we are connected by the fact that we are a body of Christ, whether we're here on this plateau or whether we are in a foreign country. And so as we, as we go to the Word of God, we, we wanna study the Word of God today. Um, if you have questions about Scotland, um, I'll be more than happy to ask, answer them after the service or at a different time, but I feel it's really important that we gather together, and I believe God has something for us today, something different than He wants to do in our lives, and so I want to pray for us. Um, if, you're, if you draw your attention, we'll probably be running through scriptures, but Romans chapter 14, if you're following along in your Bible, hopefully you did bring your Bible, um, Romans 14, you can even pull it up on your phone. Um, I, I entitled, and I, as I chatted with Gary, I said, I'll, I'll stick with the holy fire theme. How many of you like holy fire? How many, how many of you realize, like, Gary has beautiful calves, doesn't he? <laughs> Love you. I know many of you arrived today and you thought, oh, we'll be, we'll be standing up to hear Gary and his cannon of a voice and these amazing prayers only to be confronted by a Scottish pea shooter. <laughs> but we're here today, and let's seek the Lord. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you that you are the joy of the Lord. You are the joy of our salvation, God. Apart from you and Christ, we find nothing. Lord, we invite you as you are already here, but we invite you to speak to us through your word. God, give us insight, Lord. Make us more mature. Give us understanding to who you are and what you want to do in each of our lives, Lord. We thank you that we are your people, the sheep of your pasture, and God, you are the one who leads and guides. So Holy Spirit, speak. Open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy fire for the benefit of others. Um, I, wanna, I, I, I said I wanted to continue what Pastor Gary's laid down this summer. I'm starting with the premise. Um, that my goal is that we recognize what God is doing in and through us. We're in a special moment of time. How many of you enjoyed COVID? For those of you who are here, we, we want to just say we were very envious because we were locked down. And many of you are questioning why my hair looks so long. I call them my lockdown locks. I didn't get the chance to go to the barber readily over the months that we were inside our home. And in Scotland, we were having a different experience. We were allowed to go five miles within, five, within a five mile radius of our house. And so, as you can imagine, that creates challenges. But with those challenges, and as we come through this season of life, God gives us special opportunity. And I believe that we have the chance to grasp that opportunity. And I wanna, I wanna ask you, wherever you're at, Open the window of what God wants to say to you today. Listen to what he has for you, because he wants to do something in us. The desire for the Lord is that the church would grow universally and globally. It doesn't matter where we're at and what we're doing. And I wanna say this, that with those challenge, or with those growth has come great challenges. How many of you have recognized we've had challenges as the church? Yes? Anybody had challenges? How many of you recognize that there's been division in the body of Christ? How many of you recognize that those things that would be shaken can be shaken? Amen? And yet we stand at a pivotal moment where we can actually grasp on and say, God, what do you want to do for maturity in us? 
See, it was an interesting email I received. There was, for some of you, I don't know if you knew this, but there, were, there was a contentious UK and Scottish election. And they were coming up one week later, and as, as, uh, as you can imagine, everybody was talking about the elections. Did that happen here? <laughs> they were discussing uh, which party they would be going for. And to be fair, I got an email from a person and I want to read to you what it read. I redacted some of it so that you, you, you don't know who it was or what party. But I had, a, I had an email from blank party. Could we include the below links from blank office in our weekly newsletter? Blank promotes policies most Christians believe in. Most Christians believe in. I did some investigating, which really has, you, you know, well, I did some investigating, let me, let me say that. And initially, I thought that the link that he posted was relatively divine, or really benign. But as I read it, I realized the phrasing and the wording held some presuppositions. And although I agreed, actually, with most of his positions, I realized that these presuppositions might cause the church to question my personal motives, my personal beliefs, and maybe spiritually stumble. I also recognized that the request by this person as very genuine, done from a right heart, but it could be damaging and cause division in the church. Gary and I have been talking about this, that as pastors and leaders, we're attempting to bring various individuals and characters together from differing opinions. And let me say this, many of you are characters. Wouldn't you agree, Gary? And we bring them together. Why? Because we want the kingdom of God to grow. We want the kingdom of God to be united. We want to follow the word of God. We want maturity in the body of Christ under the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But there comes with this maturity an understanding that it goes beyond our own opinions, our positions, our desires, that we learn to set aside ourselves for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of others. Or maybe I should say we reflect on how our response, our actions, our beliefs will impact others in the faith. This is maturity. Or as Paul says, you take into consideration those who are weaker. These past weeks since arriving from Scotland, I've sat in the front row right there, Mr. Barber, right next to you. Well, if you would have been there. Um, I've sat there worshiping and taking notes on, on what we call Big Gary in Scotland is Big Gaddy. That's your nickname. So if I say Gary, it's Big Gaddy, right? And, and I've been wondering, what is this teaching on holy fire? And looking back at my notes, I noticed there's one common theme that Gary keeps talking about over and over and over again, and it's maturity. How many of, you, how many of us would agree that God is doing work to mature us as the body of Christ? We will not be the church God called us to be, whether you're here in the United States or whether you're in Scotland or whether you're in the United Kingdom or whether you're in India, if you do not grow in the teachings. And if you desire revival, which I know we all desire revival, in the heart of our community and in our nations, then we have to be mature enough to steward the revival of God. Many of you have heard of the Hebrides Revival. I went to the prayer gathering this morning, and people were praying about the Hebrides Revival. Courtney and I and my children have had the great privilege of ministering in the church where the Lewis Revival started. Um, my friend happens to be the current minister, um, and it was in Barbara's Chapel on the Isle of Lewis where those two women gathered together, one blind and one infirm, beginning to beg God for a work. How many of you are begging God for a work? Raise your hand if you're begging God for a work in this nation. Good. He sees it. See, revival is not easy, nor is it obtained through a phrase called holy fire. If you want to go to Barvis, for example, you have to take a ferry to Stornoway, and you have to cross over the Minch, and the Minch is not the nicest waterway that you'll ever cross. Usually, people get sick in the bathrooms. Then as you cross over the Minch, you, you come to this peat-filled moor with no trees and one road to Barvis. 
And you can imagine how difficult it might have been for that minister, Duncan Campbell, to cross, to get there for revival. It was complicated. When you arrive, all you come to is this small little wee church in the smallest community you've ever seen. And you instantly say, God, how could you do that here? My prayer today is that we press into the Lord. And if we learn anything from that kind of revival, it's not about a pulpit, it's not about here, it's not about a place, but a space and time when hearts are available and open for the move of God. Are you available? If you're available, the Lord wants to use you. Why? Because this window has arrived. And my prayer today is that we press in for the things of God, the fire of God. So today, we'll simply survey some chapters. So if you're following along in your Bibles, we're going to ask you, how might these scriptures teach and apply to our maturity in Jesus Christ? And I'm clearly aware that Paul had not attained these things when he wrote them, but he does say we press on towards the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus, Philippians 14. That word for upward is anno, which gives the notion of being filled to the brim. Now, in Scotland, we have instant coffee. How many of you love instant coffee? If you come to Downfield, Mains, guess what you have gotten for the last five to six years in my life? Instant coffee. That lovely instant coffee. And then I show up at my mother-in-law's house, and she's got a coffee station. And in that coffee station, she's got one of those Kriggs. You pull down. How many of you have one of those? Just raise your hand. You're like, oh, I get good coffee. And then she also has a Mr. Coffee. And, and, and you can, I, I messed it up. I actually, I actually screwed up Mr. Coffee yesterday. But I put the grounds in, and, 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 and you fill it up, and, and you go and you grab a cup from this coffee station, and you pour all the way up to the brim, good coffee, because you're sick of instant coffee. How many of you are like that? Right? This is exactly what it means to be filled up. You fill up to the brim. Do you want to be filled? How many of you really want to be filled? All right, let's stop the service right now and stand if you want to be filled. All right. Just lift up your hands. We do this in Downfield. If you, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you come with an attitude of reverence and saying, God, you do something I can't do. And so, Father, I pray for a Holy Spirit filling right now of each person in this place. Lord, you see the hands raised. You see what you're doing. And, Father, I pray that you would fill them afresh, God, from the top of their heads to the bottom of their heels, God, that they would experience healing and joy and peace and grace and mercy. Lord, that they would know the power of salvation, that they would know the power of sanctification, that they would grow and mature in you. Why? Because you began a good work. You are faithful to complete it. And, Lord, I just thank you for each of them, Lord. You see them. Move on their behalf in Jesus' name. Oh, man, you may be seated. How many of you, he, you did say it's not a spectator sport, right? When I taught at Palm Beach Atlantic University down in West Palm, um, I would ask my students a bit more time about setting up the letters. And, and if you'll just indulge me, um, I want you to imagine multiple tables up here. And I want, I want you to imagine these tables, and I want you to think about this, that they, each one of them has multiple parchments set on it. And you can imagine what Paul is doing when he's writing the letters. He's walking over to this one. He's already written Romans, which is his magnum opus. It is Handel's Messiah for the church. But he now has come over and he starts writing letters. And he writes over, he comes over to this scroll and he says, oh, they're really messing up. And he, he goes over and he says, okay, well, I wanna write something to them. And so he writes, I appeal to you brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you might agree. How many of us say we need healing to agree in our nation? Okay, thank you. That was nice of you. <laughs> that there be no divisions among you. Oh my gosh. I thought Scots were quiet. <laughs> how about, how about, 
that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Yeah, you're getting better. For it's been reported to me at Chloe's peop- by Chloe's people. Do you realize there's people in the Bible? You know, like you got the barber people and you've got the, you know, you've, you've got, you've got Gary, big Gary people. I'm not sure what big Gary people, maybe you're big Gary people, I'm not sure. But you've got these, these people, you've got the Bates people. And in Chloe's house, there's quarreling. How many of you had that before? No, nobody comes to church and quarrels. That's, that doesn't happen. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Big Gary, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Nathan, or I follow Christ. Let me ask you the question, is Christ divided? Thank you. You guys are great. Good applicable question after this pandemic, wouldn't you agree? Over here, he's writing in a small house church to the Galatians. So he's, he's kind of put down the pen over there, and he's come over to this one. He says, formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved by those who are not gods. But now you've come to know God. Rather, you are known by God. How can you turn your back to weak and worthless things? Elementary principles of the world whose slaves you once have become and have become again. You want to avoid slavery? Avoid the elementary principles of the world and seek the powerful principles of Christ change your whole way. Or to the Colossians, we might want to move over. Oh, maybe I'll just stand right here for the Colossians, right? And he says this, put on then as chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Do we need forgiveness? Does this nation need forgiveness? Have we fought with our families? Never mind, I'll go move on. (laughs) Forgive, and you will also be forgiven. Above all else, put on love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Sounds like Galatians chapter 6. Should. Like I said, he wrote them at the same time. Different scrolls. All of these teachings in the early church are about unity. Even though we have differences. How many of you just turn to your neighbor and say, you look different? Don't take it offensively. It's okay. You look different. Some of you men are really pleased about that comment, and you women are too. Like, oh, I'm feeling good. You look different. How many of us in the last two years have seen society fracture. That what was shaken has been shaken. The themes of forgiveness, love, patience, forbearance, kindness, humility, faithfulness, they assist us. Christian, they assist you in becoming who God called you to be in this complicated world. Now, we'll go to Romans 14, but before we want to get there, I want to take a brief reprieve from the sermon just for a second. Like I said, today's the first time in 25 years I've not been without my dad here. He's my cheerleader. Ever had a cheerleader? He always said, hello, hello, every day. He called me every day during COVID and said the same thing. (laughs) I loved it. He encouraged me from the first day we met Mom doesn't want me to say it. I I won't say it. He took notice of me. He asked me about my life, what my dreams were, what I did. He taught me through his actions to value giving. He confronted me when I needed it. He was authority in my life. But he always loved. He had a simple love for people which was sincere. He was down to earth. He was kind. He saw people for who they were. He accepted their faults and he overlooked them at times, and he taught me how to do that. He was a friend at all times, like Christ. He loved my mother-in-law and my wife well, and my children well. He he started in the Lord well, and he finished well. How many of you want to do that? You want to start in the Lord 
well and finish well, and I'm indebted as a son to his example. Returning to Romans 14, I want you to look at the 13th verse, and I'm going to read something, and then I'll get into five things I think we need to work on as the church. How many of you want to work on things? Did you come here just for a service, or did you come to work? Don't answer that question. You're retired. (laughs) Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I'm persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Do not let what you regard as good be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual building up. Do not forsake, do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Replace food with whatever you want. Food is not the issue, really. It was in the early church, but we all have different issues now. It's not about the food. What issues divine the body of Christ? See, he knew that the Jews and the Gentiles were having an issue. And conversely, the Gentiles were unwilling to change their way of life for the Jew, and the Jew was looking down on them. Why? Because they've integrated into our religion. And Paul says, don't let anything happen. Don't cause your brother to stumble. You've been united into this one new man. See, the Greek word that comes from stumbling block is scandal or scandalon. It appears 15 times in the New Testament. It's literally used as a metaphor that we in our lives can trip somebody up. How many of you, in all honesty, have ever tripped somebody up? Something you did, something you said, something you, well, you did or said, right? That's really the options, right? Trip somebody up. How's that? Well, think about the scandals in the news, right? Think about the scandals we deal with. Aren't they inerrantly driven by some selfish desire or gain? Think about it. We know all ultimately by acting selfishly, a person can cause others to fall. Just as you think in your mind about the fallen person or the ripple effect that you've done, Jesus says this, and I love what Jesus says to Peter. How many of you love Peter? I'm watching The Chosen now. It's changing my whole view on Peter. Amen? I love Peter. He's so cool. I didn't like Peter before then, to be honest. And Jesus seems not to like Peter when he was causing others to stumble because Jesus said to him, Peter, get behind me, Satan. How many of you would like to be called Satan by Peter or by Jesus? That'd be great, right? You're a stumbling block. You are a scandal unto me for you're setting your mind on what? Things of this world, not on things of the divine. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one that we keep our focus on, and the scandal moves away. Now, at that point, Peter really does an incredible job. He had already done a good job of recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah, and for all intents and purposes, he's had a divine revelation, but it didn't last very long, did it? How many of you have spiritually come to church on a high note and left on a low note? Don't admit that. How many of you come on a low note and you end on a high note? Things change. In 1 Corinthians 1, 23, Paul calls Jesus a scandal. And do you know that Jesus was a scandal to us? Those who failed to see him would know this. He says this, We proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a scandal to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. Now, how do we avoid putting a stumbling block? I did a PhD in practical theology and Christian ethics. So we have to have something practical to leave with. So if you are taking notes, we'll have five points. How many of you have five points? Can you guys do that? Normally it's three, but I'll go with five. 
How do we avoid putting a stumbling block? Decide in your heart to live in a way that negates the stumbling block. Notice verse 13. Circle the word um, to decide. It means crino. It literally means to judge. Have you ever judged somebody? Raise your hand if you've been in judgment with somebody. Come on. Come on. We've all judged in our hearts, right? Whether that was courtroom or privately, we decide, we think, we determine what is good. It's our opinion, even if it's not right. What did Jesus do when he brought, was brought before Pilate? Anybody have a thought? You can speak up. What did he do? You guys are whispering. You can speak it out. Nothing. He was silent. It's interesting. In a number of those trials, he just remained silent. See, oftentimes our opinions lead to judgments. Ever thought about that? Which ultimately lead to separation, which divide the body. What topics in society these days are leading to separation? How about the second one? Take into consideration others. When I was at Aberdeen, um, let me tell you something. I heard a lot of opinions in the seminars, which I did not agree with, and vehemently opposed at times. The question for me coming out of that was not whether I agreed with them, but whether I could live honorably before the Lord. This meant sometimes I had to shut my mouth to things I heard. See, there's a liberation. There's a freedom, the real freedom, determined when we do not say what we think sometimes. Did you know that? Have you ever felt that? I'm seeing some nod my head, some are like, no way. Oh. Paul says this, I know I'm persuaded by the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself. Did you know that Paul knew nothing to be unclean? Whoever thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. Let me share something with you. It wasn't about the food, as I said before. It was about the Holy Spirit. Paul would have known in Acts chapter 11 and Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council that these are the decisions about food. But this is the decision about the Holy Spirit, that you walk in love. Love matters at times more than my opinion. Three. Did you get two? What was two? Take into consideration others. Very good. Um, three, get a perspective of what the kingdom of God is and what it isn't. The kingdom of God is not about food, as we've said, but something far greater. It's about perspective, who Jesus is. We live in the United Kingdom, and I live in a place where we actually admonish royalty. I love the queen. Just letting you all know that. Why? Because she loves Jesus. And I'll tell you something about learning about royalty. Royalty just exists. It's not something to be debated. God is sovereign. He exists. Christ is sovereign. He exists. He is not to be debated. He is not to be conversed with. And it's beautiful because Jesus is that person that says this, if you want, um, if you want to serve, you, you must serve others for the benefit of others. You must get a perspective of what God's kingdom is. God's kingdom here on earth is what? To seek and save the lost, to know Christ. That's what it's about. That's why we gather here together today, and to live for the benefit of others. So that's the fourth one. We get a perspective of what the kingdom is and what the kingdom isn't, and we come to this place where we live for the benefit of others. My father-in-law lived for many of you and for me. And there are two things I see in verse 18 which give, a, give us a pathway. The first thing is service. How many of you serve at church? It's not an option. It's a command. Jesus said, if you want to be great, how many of you want to be great? Come on. I want to be great. Be the servant of all. Second is mutually building up. It's compound usage. It's two Greek words, and it denotes what? Edification. And it's, it's, it's used in this this concept of alias, a reciprocal noun meaning for the other. What I do 
to edify you is for the other, it's not for myself. Mutually building up is a process by which we live for the other and we create a framework for the kingdom. If you want to change the world you live in, you want to see holy fire, you want to see revival, edification. Even with those people you don't agree with. Why? Paul writes to Philippians, all of us then who are mature should take these views, this view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make it plain to you. When I walked out of those seminars, I knew that, that God would make it plain. I didn't have to be the one that would tell them that what they were thinking was either right or wrong, even though I thought it was wrong. God knew. God will make it clear, just be patient. This brings us to the last point. Do not destroy the work of God. Paul uses that in Romans. I've noticed that word. It's complicated. How many of you notice that things don't I went into the coffee shop today, and it was founded in 2019. So excited about Calder's. I did go in there today. I always have a ritual routine of trying to get a coffee. Um, and I was here at 7 o'clock for an hour prayer. Anybody here? No, I was with the angels. Praise the Lord. Um, and I was praying, and I was seeking the Lord, and I was looking for Him, and I realized something, that we live in a place that doesn't move at the same pace as you. We've had Christianity for 1,500 years. My house was built in 1813. That's older than Highlands. Whatever pace you move at, however far along your relationships are with people, because pace is different. Either way, these biblical principles are set out that in every age, we, we purpose in our hearts not to destroy the work of God. Have you noticed in our modern world conversations, opinions are resulting in the death of friendships, business partnerships, marriage, and cancel? How many fam families are damaged because we have failed to grasp this thing of maturity or the consideration of others? But I was encouraged yesterday. My goddaughter is here. And Helena is reading a book about how to start conversations with others. And I was so proud of you, Helena. Why? Because we all need this. We need to get better. And how do you share your faith? I'm so proud of you. I want to bring you back to my original email. And how that initial email played out. Because I think there's a learning lesson in it. The first um, was the request that he had made. And I want, I want you to listen very carefully to what happened in the second and third email dialogues. My response was, dear, I have the responsibility of wearing two hats in this situation. One, as a voting resident of the United Kingdom, and second, the pastor of Downfield Mains Church. As pastor, once I start endorsing one party or letting those in the congregation do it, other members will want their political party endorsed as well, and we have multiple parties in, in the United Kingdom. As shepherd, I will not divide the church over an election. Although I may, be deeply, I may have deeply held personal views, and I do, I hope you can understand that I need to be able to speak biblical power and truth to all parties, no matter who you are when you walk through the church door. I endorse a political, I don't endorse a political party. Instead, I want to talk about biblical issues. And I said this, in this moment, I lose my voice to speak to those issues because I fear dividing the church to which I alone will stand before Christ and give an account on the judgment day. His response which is laced with incredible maturity. Incredible maturity. Yep, I guess you couldn't endorse any party. I guess if you would just scrub my personal comment from the email, which isn't helpful in my own view, thanks, Pastor. God wants to do a work in you and me. 
And it comes down to this, that God wants to bring us into the fullness of who we are in unity, but it's going to take maturity. Exactly what you've been preaching. And it's going to take us in a position in which we might have to go low, recognizing that what we say will cause hard times or cause complications. But continue to pray. How many of you pray? You love prayer. Pray for this nation. Pray for Scotland. Pray for the world. Seek to go low that you might be exalted in the eyes of God. And let me tell you something. He will win the day. God is in the business of building his church, and he will do it. Amen? Amen. I want to pray that you are filled again with holy fire, but I want to I thank you for the privilege of being up here. Gary, thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, you would take your word and you would bury it deeper in our hearts, Lord. I thank you for the scrolls that Paul wrote to the churches and the admonition he gave. Father, I pray that you help us in unity and, and in growth, Lord, that we might, um, we might seek to change this plateau, that we might seek to know what you're doing in Scotland, Lord. We pray for the nations to have a revival. We pray for that revival. Father, would you begin the revival in us? Would you, would you save us to the uttermost? And Father, for those who do not know you in this place, God, would you reveal yourself to them? Father, just as Stephen used his shoe, God, would you reveal yourself? Would you reveal your truth? God, would you open eyes in the name of Jesus? Lord, this is the prayer that we have. And Father, we thank you that you died and you rose again to give us your mercy, to give us your grace, and to give us true freedom. So, Lord, may you be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name.